gentlemen, good afternoon. Last lesson was concerned about kinetics of chemical reaction. And uh, we saw the speed of chemical reaction. Now, the today lesson is concerned about chemical equilibrium. Chemical equilibrium means that uh, there are particular chemical reactions that do not attain completion. Well, let's see this reaction. This is an homogeneous reaction, a reaction that occurs in gaseous phase, and all the compounds involved in this chemical reaction, namely the reactant A and B, and the product of reaction C and D, are all in the gaseous phase. Then A, B, C, and D, uh, written in small letters, are the stoichiometric coefficient, which means that A molecules so of the compound A in gaseous phase reacts with B molecules of so the gaseous compound B to give C molecules of the gaseous compound C and D molecules of the gaseous compound D. Well, let's uh, report on a diagram concentration of all the species involved in the chemical reaction, namely the concentration of the reactants A and B and the concentration of the product of reaction C and D as a function of the time. And we see that the concentration of compound A and compound B reactants at time zero are uh, A0 and B0. Uh, bear in mind, please, that when there is the chemical formula of a compound between square bracket, it means, this way of writing means that this is uh, the concentration of this chemical species expressed as mole per liters. So, at time zero, concentration of A, concentration of B is A0 and B0. So, the diagram begins from this point. Then, <coughs> the concentration of A and the concentration of B begins to decrease. In, at the beginning of this reaction, the decrease is quite slow, but as time goes by, we realize that this decrease of the concentration of A and B becomes slower and slower with time, until, well, finally, the concentration of A and B seems to asymptotically tend to a particular value, and this, uh, this value will not be got over anymore. Contemporaneously, at the time zero, the concentration of the product of reaction C and D is exactly zero. When the reaction begins, well, the concentration of C and D becomes sensibly different from zero. And uh, so the concentration of C and D begins increasing, increasing. At the first stage of this chemical reaction, the increase of the concentration of C and D is quite fast. But as time goes by, also in this case, we see that this increase of concentration of the species C and D becomes slower and slower with time. And finally, it asymptotically tends to an asymptotical value. It appears as if the reactants A and B has lost the ability to react to give further product to C and D. Well, it is not so. The fact is that when the reactant A and the reactant B react with each other and the compound and the product of reaction C and product of reaction D are formed, the product of reaction C and product of reaction D, they may react with each other, thus giving back again the reactant A and the reactant B. Obviously, speed of this reaction is proportional to the concentration of the various species involved in the reaction. 
This is the reason why we see that the speed of reaction, the speed of the direct reaction, namely the one which bring from left to right, from the reactant to the product of reaction, seen um, as time goes by, become, becomes slower and slower. And <coughs> when the, and also the speed of the opposite the reaction, of the reverse reaction, namely the reaction which brings from the product of reaction C and D to the reactant A and B, increases with increases the concentration of C and D. So when uh, the concentration of all the species involved in the reaction A, B, C, and D do not seem to arrive anymore, what occurs is that the two opposite reactions, the one which bring, which transform A and B in C and D, and the one that transforms C and D in B and A, occur at the same rate. So, who observes this reaction has the feeling that nothing more is reacting, but it is not so. The fact is that the direct reaction which transform B and C, B and A into C and D occurs at the same rate than the reverse reaction which brings from C and D to A and B. It is that that. So we have that when the concentration of the various species involved in the reaction does not vary anymore, the condition that is fulfilled is this one. Namely, the rate of the direct reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Rd, Rd is the rate of the direct reaction, Ri is the rate of the reverse reaction. <clears throat> this situation is a situation of chemical equilibrium. And as whatever system is in dynamic equilibrium, it obeys to the Le Chatelier principle. Well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we will see that um, this uh, chemical equilibrium it complies perfectly with the Le Chatelier principle. We will see this fact later. Now, let's see how this uh, problem of chemical equilibrium can be mathematically treated. We have that if we have a single step reaction, we have that the rate of the direct reaction is equal to the product of the kinetic constant Kd of the direct reaction, which multiplies the concentration of the reactant A elevated at um, uh, 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 an exponent which is equal to its stoichiometric coefficient, and also multiplied for the concentration of the reactant B um, elevated at that exponent equal to its stoichiometric coefficient b. We can say now we are referring to a single step reaction, but if the reaction is not a single step, this demonstration is a little bit mathematically more complicated, but the final result is exactly the same. So I will show you the demonstration of the load and the result from this mathematical consideration only in the case of a single step reaction. The extension of this mathematical demonstration to more complicated cases, namely non-single step reaction, it will be a little bit more complicated, but it's useless to waste time in demonstrating it. So I repeat. The rate of the direct reaction, the uh, kinetic law of the direct reaction is that the rate of the direct reaction is equal to the product of the constant kinetic constant of the direct reaction Kd, 
multiplied by the concentration of A elevated at an exponent with e, which is equal to the stoichiometric coefficient A of compound A, and also multiplied by the concentration of reactant B elevated at the, an, an exponent which is equal to the stoichiometric coefficient B. We also have, we also can write the kinetic law of the reverse direction, or of the reverse, of the reverse reaction, Ri, and it is equal to the kinetic constant of the reverse reaction, Ki, multiplied by the concentration of the product of reaction C elevated at an exponent which is equal to its stoichiometric coefficient C, and also multiplied by the concentration of the, re the product of reaction D elevated at the, uh, an exponent which is equal to its stoichiometric coefficient D. But at equilibrium, the condition that must be fulfilled for equilibrium to be attained is that the rate of the direct reaction is equal to the rate of the, di of the opposite of the reverse reaction. So being equal the first member of these two expressions, also the second member of these two expressions will be equal. So we have that KD multiplied by A elevated at an exponent A equal to its stoichiometric coefficient, multiplied by the concentration of reactant B elevated at exponent B, which is equal to the stoichiometric coefficient B, will be equal to the product of Ki, namely the kinetic constant of the, of the reverse reaction, multiplied by concentration of product of reaction C elevated at um, exponent which is equal to the stoichiometric coefficient C of compound C, multiplied also by the concentration of, of <coughs> the product of reaction D elevated at an exponent which is equal to the stoichiometric coefficient D of product of reaction D. By simply mathematically rearranging this expression full, we obtain expression phi. Namely, we bring concentration of A elevated A, a concentration of B elevated B at this member, and we bring the, the kinetic constant Ki to this other member. And we obtain that the ratio of the product of the concentration of product of reaction, each one elevated at an exponent which is equal to their stoichiometric coefficient C and D, to the product, product of the concentration of reactant, each one elevated at an exponent equal to their exponent uh, today coefficient, uh, uh, stoichiometric coefficient, will be equal to the ratio of the kinetic, uh, of the constant, kinetic constant of the direct ray reaction, uh, divided by the kinetic constant of the reverse direction. Well, the ratio of the kinetic constant of the direct reaction to the kinetic constant of the reverse reaction is, by their turn on its turn, another constant, which is, say, the Kc, namely the equilibrium constant. If we write the Arrhenius law for Kd, the kinetic constant of the direct reaction, a Ki, the kinetic constant of the reverse reaction, we have that K, um, Kd is equal to A, frequency factor, elevated at the activation energy of the direct reaction divided by R, universal constant of gases, multiplied by T, 
absolute temperature and the as far as the reverse reaction is concerned we have that the kinetic constant of the reverse reaction ki is equal to the product a frequency factor divided by a elevated a at e a of the reverse reaction divided by r universal constant of gases t absolute temperature well this diagram that is reported here um, clarify which are the activation energy of the direct reaction and the activation uh, the activation energy of the reverse reaction namely this is the activation energy of the direct reaction namely the difference between the energy the potential energy of the reactant and the energy of the activated complex whereas this other segment represents the activation energy of the reverse reaction, reaction namely the difference of energy between the energy of the product of reaction and the energy of the activated complex so by substituting expression 6 in, in at the place of kd and expression 7 for ki we obtain this expression namely the ratio of the product of the concentration of product of reaction each one elevated at, at an exponent equal to its stoichiometric coefficient divided by the product of the concentration of reactant each one elevated at an exponent equal to, an, to, to the stoichiometric a coefficient to its stoichiometric coefficient is equal to the ratio between the kinetic constant of the direct reaction to the kinetic constant of the reverse reaction but the kinetic constant of the direct reaction because of the Arrhenius law written for the direct reaction is this one a at elevated at E of the direct reaction, EA of the direct reaction divided by RT and KI is equal to the product of the frequency factor A divided by E elevated at minus EA -A -A of the reverse reaction divided by RT by simplifying A and D and by performing this simple calculation we obtain that it is equal to a elevated at minus activation energy of the direct reaction minus the activation energy of the reverse reaction divided by rt but look at this diagram the difference between the activation energy of the direct reaction namely this segment and the activation energy of the reverse reaction namely this other segment will be this segment and this segment is the difference of energy between the product of reaction and the reactant namely is the delta H of the reaction itself so we can say that this expression is equal to E elevated at minus delta H divided by RT and this expression is equal to the equilibrium constant of the reaction namely the equilibrium constant of a reaction is a function only of the absolute temperature at uh, unlike the kinetic constant which always increases with increasing temperature the equilibrium constant increases with temperature 
when delta H is positive, namely for an endothermic reaction, namely a reaction which absorbs it, whereas it may also decrease with increasing temperature when the delta H of reaction is negative. So negative and negative, we will have a positive, a positive exponent, and as the variables appear at the denominator of the fraction, we will have that with increasing temperature, the, the, um, uh, the constant, the equilibrium constant will decrease with increasing temperature. Well, this expression which is reported here, namely that the ratio of the product of the concentration of product reaction, each one elevated at an exponent equal to its stoichiometric coefficient, divided by the products of the reactant, each one elevated at an exponent equal to its stoichiometric coefficient, at a constant temperature, is a constant and it varies with temperature according to this function, namely Kc is equal to E elevated at minus delta H divided by Rp. This is the max action law, which rules all the system in chemical equilibrium. Mass action law, we saw mass action law written in terms of concentration of the various reactants, and the concentration of various reactants is expressed in mole per liter. But max action law can be written in the same way, with the same validity, by using the partial pressure of every reactant which is found in the gaseous phase. As an example, for the same reaction that we have seen before, namely the reaction in which A molecules of the A compound react with B molecules of the B compound to give C molecules of the C compound and D molecules of the D compound, the mass action law may be written in this term, namely Kp is equal to the partial pressure of compound C elevated at an exponent C which is equal to its stoichiometric coefficient, multiplied by PD which is the partial pressure of compound on the product of reaction D elevated at an exponent D which is equal to its stoichiometric coefficient, divided by the product of the partial pressure of compound or reactant A elevated at an exponent A equal to the stoichiometric coefficient of compound A, multiply by its time the partial pressure of compound B elevated at an exponent B which is equal to stoichiometric coefficient of compound B. And this ratio is equal to Kp, namely the equilibrium constant of the, this reaction expressed in the term of partial pressure, okay? Now let's uh, detect the equivalency of the two way of expressing the mass action law namely the mass action law in term, expressed in terms of concentration and the mass action law expressed in terms of partial pressure. You know, you have that for this gaseous compound, the state equation of, uh, of uh, gases holds uh, 
for the wall mixture, for the wall reacting mixture, and also for the various component that uh, composes that are encompassed in the reacting in, react, in the reacting mix, mixture. So we have that instead we have that the part, the pressure of the partial pressure of each compound will be equal to the ratio of the number of mole of this compound divided by the volume of the vessel in which the reaction occur multiplied by R, which is the universal constant of gas, multiplied by the absolute temperature. So, if we substitute the partial pressure of compound C with the product of concentration of C multiplied by RT, all these elevated at an exponent c, which is equal to the stoichiometric efficient of product of reaction C. Instead of PD, we write the product concentration of D multiplied by RT, all elevated at an exponent d which is equal to the stoichiometric coefficient d or product of reaction d. Then this product is divided by another product which is obtained by multiplying instead of pa the product concentration of a multiplied by rt all these elevated at an exponent a which is equal to the stoichiometric coefficient of reactant a and instead of pb we have we substitute the product concentration of b multiplied by rt all these elevated at an exponent b which is equal to the stoichiometric coefficient b of uh, the reactant B. So by slightly rearranging this expression, we have that if we bring away, if we separate the concentration from the term RT, we obtain here concentration of C elevated at C, concentration of D elevated at D, here concentration of A elevated A, concentration of B elevated at B. And here we have RT elevated at C. Here RT elevated at D. And at the denominator we obtain RT elevated at A and RT elevated at B. We can write that this fraction, this ratio is equal to the max action law expressed in term of concentration, namely this ratio is equal to the equilibrium constant expressed in terms of concentration, namely Kc. And this other fraction is equal to Rt elevated at C plus D minus A minus B. This sum C plus D minus A minus B is the variation of mole numbers delta N occurring during the reaction. Namely, if we start from one mole on compound A plus one mole on compound B and reacting, it gives rise to one mole of compound C and one mole of compound D. We have that C is equal to 1, D is equal to 1, 1 plus 1, 2, but A is equal to 1, B is equal to 1, we have 1 plus 1, minus 1, minus 1, the result is 0, namely delta N in this reaction is 0, okay? So is the difference between the number of mole or product of reaction and the total number of mole or reactant. If we have that delta N is equal to zero, we have that RT elevated to zero is equal to one. So we have that KP is equal to KC. 
Namely, we have that if the reaction occurs with no variation of number of moles, we have that the numerical expression of the constant of equilibrium expressed in terms of partial pressure is perfectly equal to the numerical expression of the constant of equilibrium expressed as equilibrium, as concentration. If delta n is different from zero, they will have two different numerical value, okay? Let's make an, some example. Using the example, it will be easier to understand all what I've been saying in principle up to now. We take a real reaction which occurs between carbon monoxide, CO, in gaseous space, which reacts on with water vapor, H2O, in gaseous space and gives rise to hydrogen in gaseous space and carbon dioxide in gaseous space. I forgot to tell you that when uh, a situation of dynamic equilibrium is attained, it will be denoted by the double arrow. It means that the reaction may occur going from uh, left to right or from right to left. You know, when a situation of equilibrium, of chemical equilibrium occurs, it is useless to say which are the reactant, which are the product of reaction. But we keep on saying that the chemical compound that they are written on the left of the double arrow are the reaction, and on the right of the double arrow are the product of reaction. So, for this reaction, we can write the, the um, mass action law expressed in terms of concentration. So we have that the concentration of hydrogen elevated at an exponent equal to its stoichiometric coefficient. The stoichiometric coefficient is one the exponent is 1, multiplied by the concentration of CO2 elevated at a um, stoichiometric coefficient at an exponent which is equal to its stoichiometric coefficient which is 1, so we have concentration of carbon dioxide at elevated at 1, divided by the concentration of carbon monoxide elevated at one exponent which is equal to the stoichiometric coefficient of carbon monoxide and multiplied by the concentration of water vapor elevated at an exponent one equal to its stoichiometric coefficient. So all this expression, this ratio is equal to the equilibrium constant expressed in terms of concentration. But we may write the concentration as the ratio between the number or more of each compound reactant or product of reaction and the volume of the vessel in which the reaction occurs. So we can write that the concentration of hydrogen is equal to the number of moles divided by the volume of the vessel. The concentration of carbon dioxide is the ratio between uh, of the carbon of the number of moles of carbon dioxide to the volume of the vessel. At, at the denominator, we have the concentration of carbon monoxide is the ratio between the number of moles of carbon monoxide to the volume of the vessel, and the concentration of water vapor is the number of moles of water vapor 
to the volume of the vessel. But this volume is eliminated with this volume. This volume is eliminated with this other volume. We obtain that the, the constant of equilibrium expressed in terms of concentration will be equal to the number of mole of hydrogen multiply the number of mole of carbon dioxide divided by the number of mole of carbon monoxide multiplied by the number of mole of water vapor. You see that in this reaction, the volume of the reactor in which the reaction is occurring disappears from the mass action law. This is the reason why this reaction is not affected by the volume where the reaction occurs. Well, and it can also be explained by considering the Le Chatelier equilibrium principle. This reaction occurs with no variation of moles. Look at this. Delta N is 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1. So delta N is equal to zero. As there is no variation in the number of mole, the variation of volume of the reacting system and pressure on the reaction system do not play any role in affecting this equilibrium. Actually, we can make, we can reason in the same way if we consider the mass action law for this equilibrium written in terms of the partial pressure. We have that the constant of equilibrium expression in terms of partial pressure will be equal to the ratio of the product of the partial pressure of hydrogen elevated at an exponent one which is equal to the stoichiometric coefficient of hydrogen multiplied by the partial pressure of carbon dioxide elevated at an exponent one, which is equal to the stoichiometric efficient of carbon dioxide, divided by the product of the partial pressure of carbon monoxide elevated at an exponent one, which is equal to the stoichiometric coefficient of compound CO and also multiplied for the partial pressure of water vapor multiply elevated at an exponent which is to the stoichiometric coefficient of water vapor which is equal in this case to one. But we have that the, the partial pressure of hydrogen is equal to the product of the total pressure of the system multiplied by the mole fraction of hydrogen in gaseous phase. Whereas the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is equal to the product of the uh, total pressure that, the, uh, that the, there is that is found in the vessel of the reaction P tot multiplied by the mole fraction of the carbon dioxide in the gaseous phase. And also we have that the partial pressure of the carbon monoxide will be equal to the product of the total pressure which is in the vessel where is the reaction is occurring, multiplied by the mole fraction of carbon monoxide in gaseous phase, also multiplied by the product of the total pressure that is in the vessel where the reaction is occurring, multiplied by the mole fraction of the um, water that is in this vessel. We have that this P total is eliminated with this other P total. This P total is eliminated with this other P total. So in the mass action law, it will remain only the product of the 
mole fraction or the product of the mole fraction of the product of reaction, namely YH2 multiplied by YCO2 divided by the product of the mole fraction of reactant CO and H2O, which is YCO multiplied by Y H2O. As in this reaction, we have that the symbol of total pressure, which is in this reacting system, disappears completely from the mass action law. We have that this reaction is not affected at all, but the pressure at which the reaction is performed. Now, let us consider this other reaction, which is another real reaction, namely is the gaseous dissociation of phosphorus pentachloride in phosphorus trichloride and chloride or gaseous. If we write the mass action law for this equilibrium reaction in terms of the concentration of the reactant species, we have that the equilibrium constant Kc is equal to the product of the concentration of the product of reaction, namely concentration of PCl3 times the concentration of Cl2 to the concentration of the reactant PCl5. Okay, but we can substitute the concentration of the various reacting species, PCL3, CL2, PCL5, with the ratio of the number or more of each one of the reactant or product of reaction to the volume of the vessel in which the reaction occurs. And we can write, we can substitute the concentration of PCL3 with the ratio number of mole of PCL3 divided by the volume of the vessel. Whereas the concentration of Cl2 may be written as number of mole of Cl2 divided by the volume of the vessel in which the reaction occurs. And also we have that PCL5, we have that it is equal to the number of mole of PCL5 divided by the volume of the vessel. This volume is eliminated with this other volume, but the volume of the vessel remains in this expression. So it may rearrange this expression to this other way, in which we have that the equilibrium constant expressed in terms of concentration is equal to a product, a product of this ratio of the product of number of mole of PCL3, now there is a more small mistake, times the numbers of mole of gaseous chlorine divided by the numbers of mole of PCL5 multiplied by 1 divided by volume V. If volume V increases, we have that this fraction 
if it increases, we have that this fraction decreases. Being this product of this fraction for this fraction a constant, if this fraction decreases, decreases, we have that this fraction must increase, which means that to increase this fraction, we have that further n number, further chlorium pentachloride must react to give rise to further phosphorus trichloride and phosphorus chlorine. Namely, the denominator of this fraction must decrease and the numerator of this fraction must increase. And so it will be the only way for this fraction to remain constant, okay? So, we have that this behavior perfectly comply with the Le Chatelier law has. This is a reaction that occurs with mole variation. Namely, we pass from one mole of reactant to one plus one mole of product of reaction. So this is a reaction which occurs with the increase of number of moles. So when the volume of the vessel in which the reaction occurs will become greater, the pressure of the system will become lower and the system will react so as to make the smallest possible the, the perturbation that we have brought to the system. The, the perturbation has been an increase in, in volume and so on decrease in pressure and to make the smallest possible the decrease of pressure it will be favored the dissociation of phosphorus pentachloride into one molecule of phosphorus trichloride and gaseous chlorine which will make minimum the decrease of pressure, okay? <clears throat> Let's see always the same example. If we can write the mass action law of the gaseous dissociation of phosphorus pentachloride into phosphorus dichloride and chlorine, we can write that the, the equilibrium constant in terms of partial pressure Kp is equal to the ratio of the product of the partial pressures of phosphorus trichloride times the partial pressure of chlorine to the partial pressure of phosphorus pentachloride. But we can substitute the partial pressure of each one of the reactant or product of reaction with the product of total pressure of the system times the composition of the system, namely the mole fraction of each compound. So we can write instead of partial pressure of PCL3, we can write the product of total pressure times the mole fraction of, of phosphorus trichloride, namely YPCL3. And in the same way, we have that the, the partial pressure of gaseous chlorine, it will be equal to the product of the total pressure existing in the system multiplied by the mole fraction of compound Cl2 in the gaseous phase, namely the uh, mole fraction YCl2. This product will be divided by the, instead of the partial pressure of compound PCL5 pentafluorur of phosphorus, the product total pressure present in the system times the 
small fraction of phosphorus pentachloride, namely Y phosphorus pentachloride. Well, this P total and P total are eliminated, but P total do still appear in the chemical, does still appear in the uh, expression of the max section law. So we will have that the, uh, the constant of equilibrium expressed in terms of partial pressure Kp is equal to the product between the product of the mole fraction of PCl3 multiplied by the mole fraction of chlorine divided by the mole fraction of phosphorus pentachloride and all this fraction multiplied by the total pressure of the system. This is the reason why that if we increase the total pressure increasing in the system for Kp, for the equilibrium constant expressed in terms of partial pressure to remain constant, we have that if P total is increased, these, these, these fraction will allow to decrease. And to decrease this fraction, it means that the numerator of the fraction must decrease and the denominator of this fraction must increase. Namely, some mole of PCl3 will allow to react with some mole of Cl2 to give some mole of PCl5. Up to now, we perturbed the equilibrium. Always consider a physical factor of, over which uh, that the control this equilibrium reaction. Uh, beyond volume, beyond total pressure, there is another physical factor that uh, affects a lot the the equilibrium constant, the equilibrium of the system. And this other physical factor is temperature. And we have that if, we already saw, we already said it, if the delta H of the reaction is lower than zero, namely it is an exothermic reaction, an increase of temperature favors the process that absorbs it and thus it enhances the reverse reaction. Whereas if delta H is higher than zero, namely it is an endothermic reaction with absorb heat, an increase of temperature favors the process that absorbs it, and in this case is the direct reaction. Then it must also be said that this equilibrium can be perturbated by varying one of the chemical quantities that affect this equilibrium. And the chemical quantities that affect this equilibrium are the concentration of reactants or the concentration of pro a product of the reaction. In particular, if in a reacting system where an equilibrium reaction occur is added a number of mole or one of the product of reaction is favored the reverse reaction and uh, the equilibrium is shifted to left and this is quite easy to understand in the light of the Le Chatelier principle actually we have a system in equilibrium we perturbate this system by adding a particular number of mole, a product of reaction. The system will allow to react so as to make the minimum the perturbation that we performed. The 
perturbation that we performed was an increase of the concentration of the product of reaction to make this concentration as small as possible we will have that some product of reaction C will have to react with some older product of reaction D to give us reactant A and reactant B so the equilibrium will be shifted toward left if we add to the reacting system one of the one reagent it occurs the opposite because we perturbate the system by increasing the number of mole of the reaction the reagent the system will allow to answer so as to make the smallest possible this increase of mole of number mole of reaction so the reaction reagent A will allow to react with the reagent B to give rise to product C and product D so we have that we if we add to the reacting system some mole of reagent A we will have that the equilibrium will shift to the right okay well up to now I showed you in which way a system react when it's perturbated in some way It must be said that the equilibrium constant of a dissociation reaction may be expressed as a function of its dissociation degree alpha. It must be borne in mind that the dissociation degree when a dissociation reaction occurs, dissociation degree alpha, is defined as the number of dissociated moles of the compound that undergoes the dissociation reaction divided by the initial number of moles of the dissociation of the, the, the compound that they are present at the beginning of the reaction and the dissociation degree alpha it's a number ranging between zero and unity and also ranging between zero and 100 we have that we can write the mass action law in terms of partial pressure namely kp is equal to the ratio between the product of partial pressure of phosphorus pentachloride multiplied by the partial pressure of chloride divided by the partial pressures of phosphorus pentachloride okay I repeat the equilibrium constant kp expressed in terms of partial pressure will be equal to the product of the partial pressure of compound PCl3 times the partial pressure of Cl2 divided by the partial pressure of PCl5 if we substitute the product of uh, the partial pressure of each compound with the product of the total pressure times the mole fraction times the mole fraction we obtain that instead of partial pressure of PCL3 we can write the product total pressure times the mole fraction of PCL3 why PCL3 instead of the partial pressure of P 
CL2. We can write the product PCL2 multiplied by the mole fraction of chlorine in gaseous phase. Well, this product must be divided by the partial pressure of phosphorus pentachloride, which may be written as the product between the, the total pressure existing in the system multiplied by the mole fraction of phosphorus pentachloride Y PCL5. Well, from a simple from a simple stoichiometric balance, we can say that if alpha is the dissociation degree and the number of moles of PCL5 that are put in the reacting system are equal to N0, we have that the number of moles of phosphorus pentachloride at equilibrium, it will be equal to the product of alpha by for N0. In the same way, as alpha N0 moles of PCL3, also alpha N0 moles of NCL2 will, will, be, will appear. So the number of mole of PCL3 will be alpha times N0, and also the number of moles of, um, of CL2 will be alpha times N0. The number of mole of the compound PCL5 that were initially present were N0, but alpha times N0 moles of NPL5 are dissociated in the form of, NPC, of NPCL3 and N of Cl2. So the number of moles that will be present at the equilibrium of phosphorus pentachloride will be N0, which is the number of mole initially present, minus the number of mole that will have undergone the dissociation reaction, namely alpha N0. We can put in evidence N0 and we obtain N0 multiplied by 1 minus alpha. To have the total number of moles present in the system, we have to sum the number of moles of PCL3 of Cl2 and the number of moles of PCL5. As number of mole of PCL3 is alpha and zero. As the number of mole of Cl2 is alpha and zero. As the number of moles of PCL5 will be N minus alpha N0. If we put in evidence N0, we obtain N0, which multiply 1 minus alpha. So in this expression, by putting in evidence N0, we obtain N0, which multiplies alpha plus alpha plus 1 minus alpha, and alpha and alpha are eliminated, and we obtain that the total number present in the system is the product N0 times 1 plus alpha. So we have that the mole fraction of PCL3 will be the number of, of mole of PCL3 divided by the total number of uh, the total number present in the system. So the number of mole of PCL3 will be equal to N0 equal to alpha. So The, number, the total number of moles which appears as the denominator of this fraction 
we showed that it is equal to the product n0, which multiplies 1 plus alpha. Alpha and alpha n0 and n0 are simplified. And in this expression, it remains, it only remains that the number of moles of of phosphorus trichloride will be alpha divided by the total number of moles present in the system, which is equal 1 plus alpha. A similar way of reasoning, we obtain the fact that the mole fraction of Cl2 is equal to the mole number of Cl2 divided by the total number of mole presence in the system. But as in the dissociation of alpha and zero moles of PCL5, we obtained alpha and zero moles of phosphorus trichloride, we will obtain the same number of moles of gaseous chlorine. So if we obtain it alpha multiply alpha divided by one plus gas two, we'll obtain alpha gap perfectly easily. So we will obtain this or this ratio, alpha divided by uh, one plus alpha. Uh, uh, we will eliminate from this fraction n0 and n0, and it will remain also alpha divided by 1 plus alpha. The same will occur for chlorine. So the mole fraction of chloride in uh, gaseous phase will be the number of chlorine moles, which is alpha and zero, divided by the total number of mole present in the system, which is n zero multiplied by n plus alpha. n zero and n zero are eliminated, and it will remain only alpha divided by one plus alpha. As far as the mole fraction of phosphorus pentachloride, Y PCL5, it will be equal to the ratio between the number of mole of PCL5 to the number of mole total presence in the system. But we saw that if N0 are the number of mole initially present of phosphorus pentachloride. And of these N0 alpha moles, um, of these N0 moles, N0 alpha will be dissociated. At equilibrium, we will find N0 minus N0 alpha. So putting in evidence N0, we will we obtain that the number of mole of phosphor, phosphorus pentachloride present at equilibrium will be N0 multiplied by 1 minus alpha. Then we have that, we already saw that the total number of mole present at equilibrium will be the sum of the mole of undissociated phosphorus pentachloride, which is equal to N0 multiplied 1 minus alpha, minus alpha, plus N0 alpha, which is equal to the number of mole of gaseous chlorine, plus N0 alpha, which is in the number of mole of phosphorus chloride present at equilibrium. So the result, it will be N0 moles that multiplies 1 plus alpha. One N0 and N0 are eliminated, and 
we can substitute all these formulas in the expression of the mass action law and we obtain P total which multiplies this fraction, then P total which multiplies this other fraction, then P total which multiplies this other fraction. P total and P total are eliminated, so it remains only one P total. One plus alpha is simplified with one plus alpha, and we obtain it. Alpha and alpha, we have alpha at elevated at second square at the second power and at the denominator it remains 1 minus alpha which multiplies 1 plus alpha namely it is equal 1 minus alpha at the, the square power at the second power so we will obtain it that the product of the parcel of the total pressure at which a dissociation reaction occur multiplied by the ratio between the second power of alpha divided by one minus the second power of alpha is a, temp a constant temperature it is a constant okay so if the pressure of the reacting system will increase has this product must remain constant at constant temperature if it increases it will have to decrease and to decrease this fraction it will means that the dissociation degree will have to become lower so the uh, numerator it will come lower and the denominator will become larger and uh, it means that some molecule of phosphorus pentachloride will have to react with some chlorine molecule to give further further phosphorus pentachloride obviously we have that only one molecule of phosphorus pentachloride perform a smaller pressure exert a smaller pressure than two molecules two gaseous molecules such phosphorus trichloride and phosphorus and the chlor gaseous chlorine this is the reason why an increase in pressure favors the reverse reaction always uh, as uh, an example we have also have uh, that an increase in temperature of a dissociation reaction will result in shifting the equilibrium toward the right why because a dissociation reaction will definitely exhibit a positive delta h namely when a dissociation occurs you break some chemical bond and to break some chemical bond you must give energy to the system so the breaking the dissociation will occur with increasing the energy of the system so if the temperature is rising the temperature is rising by giving heat to the reacting system and the system will have to answer so as to make the smallest as possible as small as possible the performed variation the performed variation is an increase of it so is giving some heat and so the highest amount the as high as possible amount of this heat must be used by dissociating molecules of phosphorus pentachloride thus giving rise to an equal number of molecules of phosphorus trichloride and gaseous chloride.
Up to now, we have been studying always reaction that occur in a homogeneous phase. In practice, we studied all reaction occurring in uh, gaseous phase. Well, homogeneous reaction, I told you that it means that we have all the reactants and all the product of reaction that are in the gaseous, in the gaseous, uh, in the gaseous phase. We have that, we have that, uh, <clears throat> so, oh, there are also reaction with the course in heterogeneous system, such as we have carbon solid, which reacts with carbon dioxide in the gaseous phase, and it is in equilibrium with two molecules of carbon monoxide. You know, this is a very important reaction and uh, when studying fuels, and uh, this reaction is as much shifted toward right as higher is the temperature, okay? And uh, we have that in this reaction, if we want to write the mass action law following the principle that we have been giving up to now, we should write like this. Uh, by right, if we want to write the mass action law in terms of uh, partial pressure of the single compound, of the various compound, we have that the equilibrium constant expressed in terms of partial pressure is equal to the ratio between of the partial pressure of the product of reaction CO elevated at an exponent 2, which is equal to the stoichiometric coefficient of carbon monoxide, that is exactly 2, divided by the product of the partial pressure of the reactant, each one elevated at an exponent which is equal to the stoichiometric coefficient. But the two the two reactants are carbon that is in the solid phase and carbon dioxide which is in the gaseous phase. So we should write the partial pressure of carbon multiplied by the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. But it should be borne in mind that if there is some carbon present into the reacting system, we have that the partial pressure that is found in the gaseous phase of carbon is exactly equal to the vapor pressure released by the solid carbon. So at a constant temperature, this values is constant. And being a constant, this quantity, namely the partial pressure of carbon, cannot affect the equilibrium itself. So the partial pressure of carbon is encompassed into the equilibrium constant expressed in terms of partial pressure, and so it disappears from the expression of the mass action law. So we have that when we have an heterogeneous reaction, we can conclude that the expression of the mass action law, that in the expression of the mass action law, the value of the pressure of the reactant or product of reaction that are in the solid phase disappear from the expression of the mass action law. And why does it disappear? It disappear because as in the reacting system there is some solid, the value of the 
pressure that is in the vapor phase here perfectly equal to the value of the vapor pressure released by this solid and at a constant temperature this value is a constant value and being a constant value it does not have the possibility of affecting the equilibrium itself. This is the reason why the expression of the mass action law for this equilibrium is written in this way, namely the equilibrium constant expressed in terms of partial pressure is equal to the ratio of the partial pressure of carbon monoxide elevated at an exponent 2 which is equal to the stoichiometric coefficient of carbon monoxide divided by the partial pressure of carbon dioxide CO2 elevated at the exponent 1 which is equal to the stoichiometric coefficient 1 of carbon monoxide. Okay? Well, we have been saying all what there was to say about this topic. Okay? Also in the case of uh, heterogeneous equilibrium, heterogeneous equilibrium is a situation of dynamic equilibrium, namely when equilibrium is attained the same number of moles of carbon and carbon dioxide reaction to give carbon monoxide and the same number of carbon monoxide decompose to give rise to carbon solid and carbon dioxide and also this system which is in dynamic equilibrium is uh, an equilibrium and uh, a system that uh, obeys to the principle of Le Chatelier. As an example, if we increase the pressure at which this equilibrium, this reaction occurs, is favored the reaction which uh, goes to a decrease of the number of mole present in the system, of gaseous compound present in the system. As we have that, we have here on the right two moles of gaseous compound carbon monoxide and on the left we have one mole on carbon monoxide. We have that an increase in pressure will give rise to a shifting of the equilibrium toward left and will favor the reverse reaction. Or if we have an increase in temperature, an increase in temperature will favor the reaction which will absorb it. The reaction which will absorb it will be the formation of carbon monoxide. So the higher will be the reaction, will be the temperature, the higher will be the amount of carbon monoxide that will form and the, the equilibrium will be shifted toward, toward right. Okay? Well, as far as the reactive selection is concerned, all it has been said. In the next lesson, we will study the problems of uh, the equilibrium in solution, namely the high acid and bases. Something can be said also today as we still have some minutes and we'll, we'll begin to introduce the topic of the next lesson. Well, 
the first definition that was given of acid and base was the one given by Arrhenius. And according to Arrhenius, an acid is a compound which has formula HX, with X that is a, a non-metal element or an oxygenated anion that dissociated according to the reaction. HX in aqueous solution gives rise to hydroxonium ion in, in aqueous solution and the anion X minus one in aqueous solution. It must be said that the hydroxonium ion H plus in aqueous solution may not exist. The fact is that the hydroxonium ion is a very, very small cation because hydrogen is the smallest element in the periodic table. In the periodic table. When to this element, which is composed only by one proton and y an electron, we bring away one electron from this y, the dimension of the proton become very, very small because the dimension of a chemical entity is given by the dimension of the outer, outer energetic level in which are located electrons. If we completely bring away all the electrons that are kept in this element hydrogen, we make, we obtain the proton which is very, very small. This is the reason why a very large uh, superficial amount of electrical charge, superficial density electrical charge positive over the surface of the hydrogen, hydrogen ion will be created. This very high density of positive electrical charge on the surface of the hydroxonium ion will be, will uh, attract the highest number of molecules possible to create interaction between this ion and this molecule. So the ion, the hydroxonium ion bear into the solution may not exist. When we write H plus one, we intend that it will be H3 plus one, H5O2 plus one, H7O3 plus one, and so on, okay? And as always according to Arrhenius, we will have that a base is a compound that does formula MOH with M, which is a metal element, namely a uh, alkaline metal, an alkaline earth metal, or also a transition metal. And it dissociates according to the reaction MOH in aqueous solution, which give rise to M plus one ions plus hydroxyl ion OH minus one. Well, it is known that the strong and weak acid exists, and also that the strong and weak base exists. The difference between a strong acid and a weak acid is just that the strong acid undergo dissociation, undergo completion of dissociation, whereas weak acid undergo only partial dissociation. Namely, the dissociation reaction for strong acid must be written with only one arrow to point that completion of the dissociation is attained, whereas the dissociation, the partial dissociation of that weak acid undergo must be written with two arrows to point, to highlight that this is an equilibrium reaction, and that when the acid H1 is dissociated, 
Then the two fragments that have been obtained by this dissociation reaction may associate again to reproduce the undissociated acid. Well, I think that now I can stop here the lesson and we will keep on saying this. Uh, uh, we will be able to talk to these topics in the next lesson. Okay? See you in the next lesson.